The Lord wants to help you more than you'll ever know. And here's the question this morning. As we go into 2020, if I'm going to get the Lord to help me more than he has before, or if I've never had a relationship with the Lord, we would encourage you to start a relationship with the Lord. We said when we were in prayer, uh, all you have to do is say, Lord, man, I don't understand all there is to know about this Bible and about you. I understand me a little bit. But if I understand what Pastor is saying, that to start a relationship with you, all I have to do is ask you into my life. It says, he who confesses his sins before the Lord, the Lord is faithful to forgive you. He forgives you, he adopts you as his son or daughter and says, okay, let's do this. And then you begin to start this journey in a relationship with the Lord. You don't, you know, religions are about starting and connecting or signing something up to just be a part of a building. And that, that's not the way it should be. It should be relationship, not religion. And it, it, any church that understands that realizes you come just as you are and say, Lord, as best I understand you, this is what I need to do to start the relationship. And then once you've started, now the Bible says you're born again. Why that phrase? That phrase says that my spirit was really dead. That's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. My spirit was dead. I've got, you know, I made up a body, soul, and spirit. So, I, I, you know, I understand my physical body uh, and my, my soul is my emotional well-being. And I get kind of who I am. I don't understand myself completely. But there's this spiritual part. Body, soul, and spirit. And it comes alive the moment that you ask Jesus Christ in your life. And from that moment forward, you can start getting heavenly help here on earth and uh, be assured that you'll spend eternity in heaven. So if you, if you haven't made that decision, this would be a great morning to do, do that. All you have to do is pray that prayer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, well, now I have this presence in me. So the Bible describes God's presence in a couple different ways, but one of them is his omnipresence. He's everywhere at all times. It says in Psalms 139, it says, when the first ray of light comes up in the east and shoots to the west, if you could grab a hold of it and fly with it as far as it would go, it's a beautiful picture that when you get there, the Lord would still be there. That's his ability. So he's, he's everywhere. Have you ever felt like you're chasing after God? You don't have to chase after God. God isn't hiding from you. You have to simply turn towards God. He's there. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you, what I just told you is when you ask Jesus in your life, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. And so now I have this Holy Spirit's help. Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I don't want you guys to be by yourself. You guys need some help. And he said, I don't want you to feel like I abandoned you, so I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. So when you become a believer, the Holy Spirit's inside you. So his presence is inside of me. But having said all that, have you ever had moments where you're just like, God, where are you? You are a million miles away. Do you see what I'm going through? You obviously, you know, don't even know I exist. What is going on? Have you ever had those feelings? I have. There's just moments where he feels far away. But, but listen, have you ever been in a relationship with somebody? <laughs> have you ever been in the house? And we're, we're, we're in the same building. And we're physically in proximity to each other. But she feels a million miles away right now. <laughs> or I feel our relationship, we're, we're, we're in each other's presence, but we're not. Does that make sense? So you can be in the same room with somebody and they're not connected to you. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a lot of times it looks like this. Honey, can I talk to you? No, wait, wait a second. The football scores are coming in. Yeah, go ahead and talk, whatever you say. See, yeah, I'm in the room with her. And we're, she's talking to me, but I'm not really present in her presence, right? I'm not. It, it's possible to feel lonely in a crowd of people, isn't it? It is. We have this ability to just forget and somehow isolate ourselves to, to all that's going on with us. And here's what I believe and here's what I know, that, that the Lord is, is saying that you're simply unaware of my presence. You're not turning towards me. You're not experiencing my help because I'm right here waiting to help you. But 
but you haven't turned towards me to ask for my help. I can be in the room, my kids can be running around and, and they'll, they'll be trying to do something that doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work until they turn towards me. They walk towards me and say, Dad, I need your help. And then I come and I help them. But they can sit over there the whole time trying to work it out and put together that Christmas present that they think they know how to put together, but they don't. And somehow there's extra pieces. How many of you know there's always extra pieces, right? And then somebody says, it's usually a husband says, ah, we didn't need those anyways, right? <laughs> that just means he didn't read the instructions. Amen. And uh, it's in that moment, though, that, that we need help. And then sometimes we don't ask for help because we think we can do it all by ourselves. We usually come and ask for help when, when we've exhausted all of our means or whatever we've attempted to do in our relational life, our financial life, our emotional life has collapsed. It just isn't working. It's not working at all. And in that moment, we go, okay, I need to go find the Lord. I'm going to go to church or I'm going to go to a worship service or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. And what I want you to get in your heart this morning as you go through 2020 is that the Lord can walk with you 24-7, 365. The Bible says that He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never physically abandon you. I will never emotionally abandon you. You ever been in the room with somebody who, you, you know, they've, they've abandoned you emotionally. They're physically here, but they don't like me. Or we don't talk anymore. We don't have a authentic transparent relationship the lord said i'll never do that that uh, to you so if that's all true then the only question is for you and me this morning is i just have to turn towards him i have to be aware of his presence that it's there and i have to turn towards him and say okay let's do this let's do this now listen to me when you start the journey of turning towards the Lord on a regular basis, acknowledging that He's with you. Have you ever gotten in trouble for not acknowledging somebody you love that's with you? I have. And honey, I ask for forgiveness once again uh, multiple times. I need grace. Amen. Have you ever been with somebody and you just get caught up in your own little world and you're not acknowledging that they're in your presence? It's hurtful. It, it, it is. And you, you can, you know, it makes them feel lonely. The, the Lord would never do that to you. So it comes back to, then it's me. I'm the only one that's not turning. He's sitting there waiting so we can have this time together. And he's going, I'm right here. I just need you to turn towards me. And let's talk. And if you do that, and if I would do that on a more regular basis, then we would see supernatural things happen in our life. We would start to see heavenly help here on earth what the bible would call a supernatural manifestation of his glory wouldn't it be nice to live a life leaning on the lord and being led by the lord and then in addition to that seeing him do amazing things in and through me that helps all those around me it would be awesome right the truth is is that we can do that there's only a couple things that's holding us back from that. I want to talk to you about that this morning. I want to look at a guy in the Bible who kind of had this experience. His name was Moses. How many of you have ever seen the, uh, heard the story of Moses? So if you haven't, it's one of the most tremendous stories. If you've never seen the, the, the way they used to do real movies back in the Charlton Heston days, amen, where he was Moses, let my people go. I mean, it's just this epic uh, uh, TV presentation, movie presentation of the story of Moses. Moses is this great guy. He's adopted, so he's, he's probably struggling with self-identity problems and abandonment, all that stuff. He grows up under Pharaoh, but he really is a Hebrew. And uh, there comes this moment where God says, hey, listen, this was, those, are, those are my people. And Pharaoh and the group you're hanging out with is, is really treating them bad. I mean, they're in a lot of trouble. They're, they're, they're slaves. They're dying. They're being treated horribly. I want to set them free. Well, he decides he's going to manage his own way. He gets mad, and he actually kills one of the Egyptians that's, that's beating up the, the slave, the Hebrew slave. Well, then he gets in trouble for murder. He literally kills the guy, buries him, and then runs off to the desert for about 40 years. 
So he's there for 40 years. He tried it his own way. He thought he was going to do something great for God. He tried his own way and fell completely apart. And then he comes to this moment where he comes to a burning bush. I, I want to jump to that verse first. It's Exodus 3. Exodus 3. I, I want you to read this story. Now imagine you've tried to do life your own way and it hasn't worked out before. Anybody there? Anybody ever tried to do a relationship your way and you collapsed it like a flat pancake? Amen. There's no yeast in that bread. Amen. Can we just say amen? How many of you ever tried to handle your finances and you thought it was going to go really, really well and Reno did not deliver? Can you just say amen? That lousy slot machine, it did not work. I thought God was going to use that slot machine to bless me, and it didn't work. Amen. And have you ever just tried to do life or manage your finances, got away, relationships, or even, you know, uh, try to help relationships out? I mean, sometimes we think, I know what this relationship needs. I just, I, somebody's got to stand firm. I'm standing firm. You know what that usually means? That means I ain't forgiving you, and I'm mad. I'm just sticking where I'm at. When God taps you on the shoulder, he goes, how's that working for you? How's that working for you? You know, doing it your own way seems like the right way or the best way. And there's times where God gives you wisdom and you handle things right. But if it's falling apart, hey, man, give up on it quick. The quicker you turn around and ask for God's help, you're in a better place. Amen. So Moses is out there. He's, he's moving around in the desert. He's been there for about 40 years. And God says, okay, listen, you try to do it your way. It collapsed. Are you ready to do it my way? And so he's in the desert. And it says there's this angel. Here it is in verse 2. There, there, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Moses in the desert, in, in flames of fire from within a bush. So there's this burning bush. Moses sees it, but what's unusual about this bush in the desert is it's not being consumed. And Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. So it's caught his attention. That's, that's, this is the presence of God. It's caught my attention. What, what if he never went over to look at the bush? You, you can't imagine when we begin to, when I begin to share with you all the things, the tremendous string of events that happened in the life of Moses, you can't imagine what he would have missed out on if the presence of God, if, you know, I've had people drive by our church and say, the Lord told me to come into this place. I, I, I've had that happen ever since I've been here. I think that's Jen's story too. The Lord said, you're supposed to go to that church. And she goes, what? And then one of the, our church members went and had their hair done with her, and, and it, it reminded her, I, the Lord, I said, I want you here. And she'd been a blessing to our church. But see, that's a burning bush moment where you're thinking, the Lord is drawing me to something, and I need to go see what that is. And then when he gets there, it, it, he sees this, and look what it says in verse 4. Here's what I love. It says, when the Lord saw that he had, here it is, Gone over to look. So he turns himself and says, I'm in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to turn and look and talk with the Lord and see what he would have me to say. So he turns and because the Lord saw Moses turn towards him, God calls to him from within the bush and says, Moses, Moses. How many of you know that will scare you right there? I mean, that's just a fireball right there. I mean, this, this thing ain't burning. I mean... You know, this is a great s'mores party, party waiting to happen. Can you just say amen? I mean, this thing never goes out. We just, you know, hang out right here. And, and in that moment, Moses, or the Lord speaks out and says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, I probably ran away about 30 feet just because it scared the fire out of him. This is what I'm thinking. And then he comes back and goes, man, what, how does a bush talk to me? He says, uh, Moses said, okay, uh, here am I. Here am I. Who's, who am I talking to? Verse 5, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. There's something special about the moment that you're in right now. I kind of want you to slow down. I want you to run away. And I want you to linger here. Take your shoes off. Hang out with me. I want you to hang out here. Take your sandals off from the place where you were standing is holy ground. Verse 6. Then he said, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's, that's an amazing verse. What he's saying here is he's saying, 
the God of your forefathers, if you look back in history, there was these great men of God. Abraham was with was noted in the Bible as being a man that God was with him. People would say, and as you read through the Bible, it says God was with Abraham. God was with Isaac. God was with Jacob. And when we read that, what we hear the Lord saying to him, I will be with you like I was with them. That's an amazing phrase. And, and if you look at their history, throughout their life, God did amazing things for them. I mean, he helped. I mean, Abraham messed up his marriage a dozen times and God just kept trying to save him with it. I mean, he just kept making mistakes out of fear. But as we look at that, he was saying, Moses, I want you to be a person that when people look at you, they will say, God is with him. That you walk a life in such a way that people feel like you've got a relationship. He's got a relationship with God. And it's not only that I kind of sense it, I see supernatural happenings in his journey, in his walk of life. You see, sometimes we love the presence of God, and I love to run in, I love to do worship, I love to get here, I like to cry and just unload my backpack because life's just been crazy and I got all these issues and I got financial problems and I come in here and I dump them, I come to the burning bush if you will and I say man this is it God you're awesome and I love this feeling that I have, I'm leaving it here and I'm gone and then I'm out. And then sometimes if I'm not careful, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to come back to the burning bush or the presence of God or to church. I'm going to start going back into the desert start doing things my way. How tragic would it be to go do another 40 years like I just did and, and when I'm having this moment at, at the burning bush? And so Moses is sitting here, and he, he's talking with the Lord, and then the Lord demands something of him. He says, here's what I want you to do. I now want you to go back. I want you to leave this burning bush, and I'm going to go with you. And that's the picture for you and I this morning. Don't you want the Lord to go with you in 2020? Oh, man, I want him with me. I, I want him with me every day, every second of the day. I want his help. But, but if I, as I pointed out earlier, he's with you. The only question is, is are you going to acknowledge? Are you going to be aware that he is with you if you're a child of God? And then you're going to ask for his participation in your life. You know, when you do this, you'll, you'll get up in the morning and you'll take off and you'll go somewhere. And he goes, ah, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> you know that's not a good place to go. You know you always get in trouble when you go there. It makes you an emotional wreck when you go there. The Lord will say sometimes you can take off the day and he goes, you know, you've got some friends that, that you need to get rid of. There's some friends that are toxic to you. They're not healthy. You need to cut them loose. Amen. No, we're talk, not talking about being mean to them. We're not talking about, you know, just never talking to them again. But you can get some distance from them. And you know who I'm talking about because the Lord's already told you who they are. Amen. You know, we say, well, I don't know, man. I, I don't, I've never felt the presence of God. Oh, man, I bet you have. <laughs> you ever just thought, man, if my mom and dad find out what I did, that's the presence of God. He uses your mom and dad to correct you, but that's the presence of God. It's your conscience saying, man, I'm guilty. I'm wrong, man. This is bad. I do not want to see. And then when the famous words of your, your mom, you wait till your dad gets home. You ever heard that one? Wait till your dad. Man, that's fear. I think the fear from that moment till dad gets home is worse than the actual spanking when he gets home. Amen? It's just anxiety. I mean, it's terrible. But in this moment, uh, God says, I want to walk with you, but... But I don't want you to just roam around in the desert, have issues, and come back to the burning bush. Roam around in the desert, come back to church every couple of weeks or once a month or whatever. I, I want you to start hanging out with me regularly. Okay, so the first step is, okay, maybe I ought to start going to church regularly. But if you're not careful, you'll start seeing the church as a burning bush. You'll never leave the burning bush. If I go there, then I'll be blessed. It's as if I'm chasing after the presence of God and you've missed it. Because God said, I'm going to go with you. See, in the New Testament, Jesus said, I died, and I don't want you to be alone. So when you, I become your personal Lord and Savior, the God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit come inside of you, and they live in you. So that means tomorrow I can talk to them. 
I don't have to go to the church to be in the presence of God. But there is something about coming. God says, there is a special uniqueness of my presence within the church. And somehow the church helps you and I, and it's really, we're talking about a spiritual family. We're a support group to help each other keep moving in the right direction. So we are supposed to do church. We are supposed to meet regularly. But don't get it in your heart that, man, I can't wait till Sunday because I got to go talk to God because he's there at the church. No, he wants to be with you every day. And when you look at the life of Moses, Moses leaves that place and he's now going to do what he wanted to do, what God asked him to do. And there's a step of obedience required in order to start having these moments where God supernaturally meets your needs. And, And how many of you just would love God to show up every once in a while and do these supernatural things in your life? Oh man, I need those. I mean, I want a string of those. I want somebody to say, man, Pastor Steve, God was with him. Now, he's a knucklehead sometimes. But if God could take care of Pastor Steve and he loves him and he'll do mighty things through him, he could probably do mighty things through me. Amen. And he can. And so, so Moses takes off and Moses goes, man, I'm not sure about this. And God says, so listen, because you said yes to starting to live a life experiencing the amazing presence of God on a regular basis, seeing supernatural things, uh, and you said yes, and you're going to walk in obedience, here's what's going to happen. Take that staff you got and throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground and turns into a snake. How many of you are just going, a snake is not a holy moment, amen? I'm just going, you know, God, couldn't we have like a dove, a little white flowery thing? I mean, that's, you know... That's, that's the manifestation of God. I, mean, I don't know what this snake thing is. And then God says, I want you to grab it. No. I say, honey, come on over here. I'll get my wife to grab that thing. Amen? But then he said, no, I'll go grab it by the tail. And he grabs it by the tail and turns back into a staff. Man, that's, that's amazing. That's a super uh, manifested glory of God, the revealed presence of God, doing something undeniable that this is God. He says, stick your hand inside your shirt. He sticks his hand inside your shirt. He pulls it out. It's leprous. I mean, in that day, you might just say, you had stage four cancer. Okay, you're done. He pulls it out, and he's going, oh, man, God. Listen, I thought I was being obedient. I thought this was going well. This doesn't look well. I got snakes. I got diseases. He goes, put it back in. He puts it back in. He pulls it out, and his hand's extremely perfect all over again. And you're going, man, I'd love to have experiences like that, I think. Amen. Some more. I'd like the white dove experience, not quite the snake. Amen. But then if you've, if you've ever read the Bible in the book of Exodus or seen the movie, he goes in and there's these plagues that, that Moses just begins to confront in the power of God. And there's this string of amazing events. He finally gets to a place where Moses takes about a million people who are in slavery, who are uh, just emaciated and haven't eaten and have all kinds of problems and been just uh, been beaten up. He's going to take them out in the desert. The Lord leads him. Can you imagine having... A million people that you're responsible for and go into a desert where there's just, you know, no Alhambra. Amen. Can you just say amen? No Alhambra water. There's not a spigot. And these people are thirsty. He's going to go out there. And while they're on their journey out there, if you've read the story, they get to this ocean scene. And now Pharaoh's mad and he's chasing after them. And he's going to kill them. And then all these people go, great, Moses. You lead us a couple of miles out of camp and now we're dead. We're going to die right here. And the Lord says, watch this. And he opens up the sea. And all of these millions of people, this, they go across this dry land as the Lord's holding back the water. It's like the most amazing aquarium you've ever seen. Amen. I just see it that way. You're walking through there like, that's a whale. I hope you don't pop out of the water because, you know, we're, this is crazy. And then they get to the other side and then all those chasing him come in and it, it comes down on them and it kills the enemy. And we have these amazing events. But what if Moses stayed at the burning bush? What if he didn't say, I'm going to go further in my relationship with the Lord. I'm going to start leaning on Him on a daily basis. And Moses begins to go, and you find out later, he he went up on a mountain and got the Ten Commandments. He's there in God's presence. God carves out the Ten Commandments on stones and hands them to him. I mean, 
man, I, I, I'd like to have a couple of those moments in my life. And somewhere through this, Moses at the burning bush realized, I've got to stop doing life my way, turn and have an awareness that God is with me. So now that I'm aware, more clearly, he's with me, then I'm going to start asking for his help in every area of my life. And then I'm going to see supernatural things. I mean, I could tell you things uh, in my life. I, uh, as I, I look back on my life, uh, I, I see a string of events. I, I don't want them to be, that's all there is. Uh, some of you have been here in moments where we all pray. We prayed for Jim. Jim tried to scare the fire out of us. He fell, he fell down in the bag. We thought the, that he was dying, and we ran back there, and we prayed for him. And God brought him back to us, and we rejoiced. I mean, that was an amazing moment. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, as I walked off the stage, I just know the Holy Spirit said, listen, death will not happen in this house. This is a house of life, and this is not happening. That's the only thing the Lord told me. So I knew what we were supposed to do, but you're still scared. You see, you got to walk in obedience. What if I just call 911 and get him out of here and I don't even pray for him? You see, there's a step of obedience required. That's what I want to point out. I remember I was, uh, I was, there's these moments throughout my history where, here's what I want you to know. It, there are life-altering moments. So I'm walking with God, and I'm in, in His presence, and I'm asking Him to lead my life, but then He'll do something, boo, just blow it up, man. Something crazy, amazing. And the only reason that it happened, because here it is, what triggers the manifestation or this divine presence of God that you see and you experience is a step of obedience. So I get a call late at night, and there's this girl, and she's she, her and her boyfriend are demon possessed. How, how many of you know you just want to hand that call over to somebody else? Say amen. So I'm a young man of God, but I'm thinking, oh, I can do this. You know, I think I can. I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord says, well, you're supposed to go over there. I said, man, should I call the senior pastor? I call the senior pastor. The senior pastor says, no, this one's yours, man. I'm out. I go, man, you're the senior, man. I'm not this. I'm not the guy. You, you need, I don't, I don't have no experience. Oh, it'll be fine. Go. I'm going, man, he's got more confidence in me than I do. Amen. So me and my twin brother go over there, and this is a 16-year-old girl and her boyfriend, and uh, I mean, they're growling and spitting. It's, it's, it's worse than the movie, if, I, if I'm honest with you. So I go in there, and I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I just know I'm an assistant pastor, and I'm supposed to help, and uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of scared to death, honestly, right? I mean, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Nobody told me on my job description this is what I had to do. So I'm, I go in there, and me and my twin brothers start helping. And this little 16-year-old girl is probably 95 pounds, starts throwing us around like a rag doll. Just <laughs> and so we're going, Lord, we came in here in all your glory, and you, you asked us to be here. What are we You know, what's going on? And he goes, are you guys really going to try to do this in your own power? I mean, he said that like within a second. He says, you're not going to muscle them. Come on. I said, well, I'm just trying to help. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, I know, so listen to me. So then I just began to pray, and I realized the power of Jesus' name is incredible. And I began to pray for that girl, and I'd say, uh, do you want these demons out of you? And she'd go to say yes, and then this, this growl would come up in this other voice, and this demon would start talking. And I said, you know, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to shut up so I can talk to her. So in the name of Jesus, be quiet. And then she began to say, yes, I want them out. I don't know how. I said, you have to because I can't help you if you don't want them out. And so one by one, I'm casting out these demons. What's your name? Zolkar? I said, what's your name? He's talking to me. I said, what's your name? He said, oh, Zolkar. I said, well, Zolkar, you got to go in the name of Jesus. And, so, and I tell her, I said, listen, so we're going to pray. We're going to get rid of this guy. So we get rid of him. We get rid of one more, two more. We got rid of about three or four of them. I think we were up to about seven. I get to the last one. He goes, I'm the biggest. I'm the strongest. He tells me this. And and I'm, you know, but now I'm humming, right? I'm, I'm, I'm humming. I know what to do. God taught me what to do, and I'm doing this. And there's a 16-year-old, and she tells me that, you know, she thought she was going to commit suicide. And she's messing around with the Ouija board, and then Satan spoke to her through the Ouija board and said, I will make sure you don't commit suicide if you ask me into your life. And then, so that's what started this whole mess. And so she, she said, come on in, right? So this last one was the biggest and the strongest. And, and I'm sitting here, and I've, I've casted out like six of these demons with me and my brother praying over her and, and the boyfriend, which is, was another whole story. 
But this this one was really was really a bad dude. And I mean, I, I, I felt intimidated by him. And the Lord said, really, this is it's like, this is not in your power, right? Let's go back to step one. Remember lesson one earlier on in the thing? Okay, God, I got you. What are we doing now? He goes, so the guy says, uh, so I said, well, I'm like, you're out, dude. I just got rid of your friends. You're out of here. Okay. So I, I go to, to, to cast him out with the, the name of Jesus. And in that moment, he goes, so listen, I'm aware that your wife is pregnant. And that uh, if you mess with me, I will make sure your, your child dies. And he won't be born. Okay. And this is my firstborn son, Jordan, you know. So, uh, man, in that moment, man, I'm telling you, fear gripped my heart. And in that moment, I said, whoa, I did not sign up for this. I said, I literally said, man, he, you can stay then. I'm out. I mean, in my heart, just this flash went through me like, no, I am not risking my son for this i'm out and just as i'm doing that and i'm literally in my heart i'm backpedaling i'm thinking how do i just kind of get out of this the holy spirit says really so really so we cast out seven of these and we get to the last one and you're gonna wimp out and i said but you hear what he said see and i'm being real honest with you right because sometimes you just think oh man you know well you're a man of god you know you got god's power and it, it just rests in you like it doesn't with us no it rests in you like it does me. I'm as scared as you are. And in that moment, uh, you know, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but the, the Holy Spirit said, really? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm wimping out. And it was fear. It was absolutely fear. Fear was scaring me off. The Bible says, God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So, Because once you let fear in, right, your, your brain spins out. You're all over the map. So in that moment, I, I, uh, I just ramp up, man. I'm all of a sudden, it's Holy Spirit indignation because really the Holy Spirit said He's coming against me. He's not coming against you because you really can't do anything. You're powerless. You need my power. I go, yeah, you're right. He goes, this is a battle between me and Him. And so I said, listen, don't you dare. You can't touch me or my family because I'm a child of the Most High God and I have His protective power. In the name of Jesus, you got to go. And I cast Him out. And in that moment, this beautiful little girl came back. You know how tragic it would have been if I just simply would have said, nah, I ain't doing this. I'm too scared. And I pushed through all of that because I was aware of God's presence and I was letting him coach me all the way through it. What area of your life do you need the Lord to coach you through? Do you, do you let him coach you through? Are you aware that he wants to coach you? Through the relational, relational difficulties you're in. The financial difficulty that you're in. I, we don't want to talk about the finances. I got that one. Really? Do you? You got that one? The Lord said, I want, you may be doing well with your finances. The Lord said, yeah, but you can be doing much more better than if you just ask for my help. You, you see, the Lord wants relation with you. He doesn't need your money. He isn't, you know, he's not up in heaven worried that you're not going to give. He's, you know, he's not worried relationally that you're going to hurt his feelings. And then, you know, there's just such risk in our relationship. He knows everything about you. He knows when you've been mad at him. He knows when you've said bad things towards him. He knows when you've taken his name in vain. Most of us, if somebody treat me that way, I, I'm done. You know, God, you send somebody else to get him saved. I'm out. God's not like that. He loves you. He wants to help you more than you ever know. So the question for you this, this morning is, are you going to allow fear to dominate what you do this next year? You see, there's a competition for your attention, right? I mean, this is really true. Now listen to me. Um, there's a competition for your attention. If you turn your attention towards something, then you're in the presence of whatever that is, aren't you? You see, I can go on here and I can go on Facebook. And when I get into Facebook and Instagram, I'm now in the presence of Facebook and Instagram. And they're speaking to me, aren't they? And I'm starting to decide who I am based on what they think of me. That creates enormous anxiety. Can you imagine that my self-esteem and self-worth is riding on what these people say about me? 
<laughs> now, we don't think that way. We just think, oh, I hope I get a bunch of likes. Oh, man, I only got five likes. I thought those people were nicer. What's wrong with them? I mean, I'm just, you know, this ain't right. All of a sudden, you're anxious. He's like, well, what's wrong with me? If they, they liked all of her stuff, they don't like my stuff. And all of a sudden, my face is in this book when my, my face should be in this book. Right? Well, see, now I'm in his presence. Psalms 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you in your mother's womb. and You are beautiful to me and you are handsome to me. I've got plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you a great hope and a great future. That's a whole different environment I just walked into. Right? Right? The Lord says, I, I want you to turn your face towards me. I want to talk to you more often. And if you will, you'll see supernatural things. If you enjoyed the message today and you want to partner with us to reach others for Christ, click the link down below to give now.